Thank you. Wow. It's, um, it's really a pleasure. Can you hear me? Okay. It's really a pleasure to be here and to speak to a policy-savvy audience and wait for the discussion. Um, so as Professor Grogan mentioned, I'm both a psychiatrist and a cultural anthropologist. So even though I think of myself as studying the politics of drugs and addiction treatment, um, I'm not a policy analyst, and that I think will make for a very fruitful conversation. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, one of the connecting threads of my work is the way that culture shapes biology and vice versa. I'm very interested in biocultural processes. And in fact, I, I teach an undergraduate course in global biocultures, and I <laughs> Can I tell the yes, group? Yeah, <laughs> Another connection I have to Professor Grogan, which is that for a brief moment I had her daughter in, in my global biocultures class, and it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> uh, but those, those first few weeks were fantastic. Um, so in thinking about the biocultural, it turns out in my studies of addiction and drug policy that um, the mediators between culture and biology are often policy and regulation. So it's actually pretty apropos that I'm here today. Um, it's really regulation and policy that often distribute the burdens and exposures of the cultural um, on biological substrates unequally, so in, in the case of narcotics. So I've, I've long been drawn to narcotics and addiction as objects of study because we don't have a cultural consensus in this country about what kind of problem addiction is. Is it a moral problem of poor decision making? Is it a social problem of a negative environment? Is it a biological problem of neuroreceptors, deficient neuroreceptors? Um, and in practice, drug trade and drug laws are biosocial phenomena which in the cultural model of addiction, we adopt as material effects on bodies in the form of overdose, infections, and chronic disease. But at the same time, narcotics are major drivers of our economy and of national politics. For example, uh, I don't know if you knew that the US consumes 80% of the world's opioids. Can you guess what percentage of the world's population we make up? Anywhere close to 80%? No. <laughs> Less than 5%. So that's pretty profound. Um, we are the world's big opioid users. Um, billions of our tax dollars are dedicated each year to the war on drugs um, and enforcement in inner city neighborhoods and in Latin America, sustaining a secondary industry of prisons, um, espionage, tracking of immigrants across borders. These are probably very familiar themes to you all. And in the process, narcotics and addiction do, in my uh, parlance as an anthropologist, they do cultural work, key cultural work, in guarding racial boundaries and hierarchies of deservedness and moral blame in our geographically and socially segregated society. So, um, so the way that I look at addiction and drug policies is in terms of the cultural work that they do. So the idea that drugs are levers of cultural work that shape material effects on the ground is not new. Um, and nor is the idea that substances have racial identities. So you probably know that 19th and 20th century drug historians um, tell the story, usually in the form of how drugs that were previously normalized got marked as dangerous and made illegal through racialized prohibitionist campaigns. So in the early 20th century, Narcotic laws, um, such as the Harrison Act, the 1914 Harrison Act, uh, were fueled by popular press coverage of, for example, Chinese opium dens that lured unsuspecting white women into slavery, drug slavery, or cocaine-crazed Negroes in the South. Um, crazed Negroes that attacked white overseers, and also Mexican marijuana madness in the 30s. So you may have heard these, these themes. More recent version is the 1980s to 90s moral panic of inner city crack use. And I'm gonna guess that you have discussed, the, discussed uh, crack laws in this room. Um, so those images help to dismantle the social welfare system through racially coded moral blame 
and um, led to exponential growth in mass incarceration through the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986, the one that set up the um, disparity in sentencing, one one hundredth the amount of crack uh, possession for powder, cocaine possession uh, would mandate minimum sentencing. So this kind of disparity has come to think of it some parallels in the distinction that we've been making more recently between prescription opioids and heroin. You might want to keep that in the back of your mind. Now what isn't often examined in this work about how drugs get racialized and lead to punitive drug policies is how it can sometimes work in the other direction. Um, for example, how does a drug become unmarked? How can it assume and convey whiteness within a racialized logic of pharmaceutical capital? One that has deployed biomedicine in a project of pharmaceutical prosthesis. This is a concept that I'm working with right now. Pharmaceutical prosthesis, for those who are still participating in the labor market. And on the other hand, pharmaceutical control for those who are trapped outside of it. So today I'm going to show, some, show you some highlights from a book project that I'm working on with my colleague Julie Netherland at the Drug Policy Alliance that we call White Opioids. And in the process, I'm going to give you a flavor of how I backed into the question of something that's been in the news quite a bit lately, um, why life expectancy of whites is suddenly falling while the life expectancy of almost every other uh, racial group in the United States is rising and how opioids became the primary immediate cause of death, um, of excess death in this case. So it's a question that's prompted a national discourse of the endangered white American, one that likely influenced the last election actually with journalists noting that the regions that most strongly supported Trump were those with the highest opioid overdose rates. Just a quick quiz, how many of you are familiar with this piece from, that came out in um, December of, actually November of 2015 in the, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences? Yeah? It's the one that keeps getting cited about um, declining like the expectancy of white. The authors are in the Princeton Department of e Economics, Angus Deaton, who's a Nobel laureate, and Case, who, who's white. Um, so back to the question of how opioid overdose became white, um, my answer is different than the received wisdom that unemployed whites in the post-industrial Rust Belt turned to opioids for solace. So that's kind of the punchline from this article. That's the analysis of these two economists. Now, while that may be true, and in fact it probably is true, it does beg the question of why opioids and why white people? And why now? So I'm going to argue that the current generation of opioids were designed to have white racial identities. And that in our stratified healthcare system and justice system, the biotechnologies and social technologies that shape opioid consumption reinforce racial inequalities while at the same time harming whites. Now, I encountered these technologies of opioids in the late 1990s, I was a medical student um, working in a primary care clinic that was running the first clinical trials of a new pharmaceutical treatment for opioid addiction called buprenorphine. That was before it got its commercial name of Suboxone. Um, my supervisors were really excited about buprenorphine. They said it was going to change the culture of medicine. It was going to place addiction alongside asthma, diabetes, and hypertension as a real and chronic disease. Treated in the same settings, primary care settings, and in the same way with long-term pharmaceuticals as all of those other chronic conditions. And I was also working in this clinic during the late 1990s rise in prescription opioid use in the suburbs. Um, so this is a piece on Vicodin, which for several years in a row, starting in the late 90s, was the most prescribed drug in the United States. So that's ahead of asthma medications, diabetes, med diabetes medications, cholesterol-lowering agents, dot, dot, dot. Um, and so overdose followed closely behind. And this was happening, oddly enough, in the midst of a national campaign, a uh, national move towards stop and frisk and sting operations 
in black and brown inner cities that led to unprecedented incarceration rates, putting the US prison population well above every other country in the world. So I found this puzzle, and I kind of, it's interesting to just juxtapose these curves. Increasing white opioid use in the midst of an intensified inner city drug war. And this puzzle has become a part of my study of addiction pharmaceuticals, for which I've observed dozens of drug policy and addiction science meetings, observed interactions in clinics over a five-year period, and interviewed almost 200 addiction scientists, treatment advocates, uh, pharma executives, policymakers, prescribers, and patients. And I'm going to give you the punchline up front, which is that in my research, I discovered an unrecognized form of ethnic marketing um, upholding a two-tiered system of drug policy and treatment that, because it targets white people, works by not marking itself as racial. And the story is invisible by design. So that was why it was only through sustained participant observation and interviews with key participants as, a, as an addiction psychiatrist myself that I've been able to unravel the threads of the story. Now, I mentioned that I started this project with Suboxone. Um, and it's easiest to see the racial identity of Suboxone by comparing it with its predecessor, Methadone. So this is a graph a bar graph from the first and last nationally representative sample comparing uh, methadone patients with buprenorphine patients by race and class. And um, this pattern I managed to reproduce in maps that I, uh, that I made with prescription data on buprenorphine patients in New York City and its borough versus methadone patients in um, New York City and its borough. And the interesting thing about these maps is their heat maps showing density of prescriptions. They're almost the inverse of each other. So um, really what we're seeing on the buprenorphine side is neighborhoods that are predominantly white and higher income um, have the highest prescription rates and neighborhoods on the methadone side that have lowest income, the lowest percentage of white residents have the highest methadone prescription rates. Now what we don't know from these maps is by what process did these two um, medications slash drugs get their racial identities? So for that, um, I'm going to take a step back in history. So we're going to go back to 1965. Race riots have burned through Harlem, Philadelphia, and Watts, Los Angeles. The unemployment rate for blacks is twice that of whites. And the mafia gains control of Asian heroin imports, recruiting a sales force from these unemployed, unemployed populations in black and Latino inner cities. Meanwhile, Rockefeller University diabetes researcher Vincent Dole, who thinks of heroin addiction as opiate receptor deficiency, analogous to insulin deficiency in diabetes, um, publishes, he publishes the findings from the first clinical trial of methadone maintenance. So he's thinking of people who are heroin addicted as having deficient opioid receptors in the brain and requiring exogenous external opioid maintenance for normal function, kind of like a diabetic requires insulin. The study's subjects are African-American heroin injecting men from Harlem, and the outcomes of decreased criminal activity and increased employment at six months brings it national attention. So you should understand this is from the, this is 1965 Annals of General Internal Medicine, or Annals of Internal Medicine. Uh, it's very, it is still very rare and was rare for social outcomes to be reported in this clinical journal. So the highlights here were not only uh, lower relapse rates, they were employment and incarceration. So that's an interesting point. Nixon gets news of this, um, and by 1970, he uh, appoints the nation's first drug, drug czar, Jerome Jaffe, who's a pioneering methadone psychiatrist uh, and who makes methadone the first weapon in the U.S. war on drugs. Jaffe targets inner city blacks and Latinos as well as returning Vietnam veterans with methadone. And um, in order to prevent diversion and street sale of methadone, the DEA regulates methadone clinics requiring daily observed dosing and regular urine testing 
And due to the resistance of many communities to the location of a methadone clinic in their neighborhood, the clinics are located in marginal neighborhoods of the city, usually far away from the rest of clinical services, whatever, whoever the sponsoring hospital is. Um, so you can see here, already geographically, methadone is kind of liminal as a form of clinical care. We're going to fast forward to October 8, 2002. A new kind of opiate problem has developed following Purdue Pharmaceuticals' aggressive marketing of OxyContin as, quote unquote, a minimally addictive pain reliever. Most of the new addicted, newly addicted people are white, and many of them are middle to upper income. The FDA has just approved a synthetic opioid, buprenorphine, otherwise known as Suboxone, for maintenance treatment of opiate dependence in private buprenorphine certified doctor's offices. Pharmacologically similar to methadone in that it blocks opioid receptors in the brains of addicted patients, buprenorphine can be prescribed monthly for use at home, while methadone is restricted to these DA regulated clinics that I just described with directly observed dosing. So it's worth it to note that this is the first time since the 1914 Harrison Act that general doctors have been permitted to prescribe opioids to treat opiate addiction in their private offices. And I also think, uh, because you're a policy savvy group, that we should remember that methadone came of age in the era of big government, you know, the 60s and 70s, war on poverty, and that the goal really was containment of these imagined unruly populations of displaced workers. Buprenorphine, three decades later, in contrast, came about in the post-Reagan era of the 90s, the era of privatization and shrinking government, not to mention the Prozac era of enormous growth in the psychotropic drug market among pharmaceuticals. But nonetheless, the manufacturers of buprenorphine and the architects of buprenorphine policy almost 30 years after methadone had to distinguish buprenorphine symbolically and spatially from the racially burdened and clinically marginalized methadone. Buprenorphine, uh, pharmacologically in the same drug class as methadone, both of them are opioids, had to be whitened. So um, I'm going to show you, let me attempt a multimedia presentation. I'm going to show you an ad. So then you like played football in high school, sang in the church choir, classic American upbringing. I used to look at people who used and abused drugs as people who were making a choice. They chose to do that. How could it happen to me? In 1999, we were remodeling our restaurant, and somehow I hurt myself. Our family doctor, the young painkiller, took an aspirative. By the time 2004 came, my life was just a So you can, you can tell that there's uh, a lot going on in the SAB. There's a lot of cultural work, again, to go back to my anthro speak taking place in this ad. Um, so Mike is in this ad for Suboxone. This is a website sponsored by the manufacturer of, of Suboxone, Reckitt Ben Kieser Pharmaceuticals. He's, sit he's seated in his Ohio diner. He's a, he's a diner, o I, diner owner, um, flanked by the American flag talking about returning to coaching his son's baseball team and singing in his church choir. And talking about how buprenorphine prescriptions rescued him from a prescription opioid problem following a back injury. So this is uh, an ad that's really framing buprenorphine as apple pie. But I argue that the, this ad was just the tip of the iceberg, that the whiteness of buprenorphine was actively achieved by specific social technologies. So, to get back to my <coughs> slides. Yes. 
Um, I'm going to give you my analysis of the contemporary white opioid crisis in terms of what I call technologies of whiteness. That is, social technologies such as neuroscience, uh, policy and industry strategies to maintain racial boundaries around biomedical uses of opioids. And my analysis is informed by critical race theory, um, an offshoot of critical race theory called whiteness studies that would predict a few things about this process, uh, these social technologies. One is, Whiteness is a category of exclusion, and so it requires cultural and political maintenance of its boundaries. The ad gives you just a flavor of what that might involve. Second, white race is unmarked. It's the assumed norm. It's rarely explicitly named, either in public policies or in the media. So many of you are probably familiar with Michelle Alexander's New Jim Crow and her uh, concept of colorblind ideology. So that's an example of what I mean, that um, drug policies in the US have been quite racially targeted without ever mentioning race. Uh, this also can refer to newspaper coverage, and I'll get back to that in a moment, but often racially coded language is used when it comes to white race. Um, so this version of colorblind ideology reproduces white privilege by eliminating racial references from seemingly universal policies and practices. And then third, whiteness is defined by its other. White and black or non-white are interdependent. So for example, punitive drug, American drug policy has long had a mutually defining twin in the form of legal narcotics for whites who have access to personal doctors. Um, and this goes way back historically, uh, starting with morphine and over-the-counter heroin for Victorian housewives when those were legal and uh, without prescription, moving to post-World War II barbiturates, stimulants and diet, stimulant diet pills, and then more recently Valium, otherwise known as Mother's Little Helper, and now back to prescription opioids. So uh, lastly, white privilege has its costs. Not only do white consumers pay inflated prices for patented prescription opioids, um, but they also pay with their lives in the form of overdose from lethal substance, substances to which they have, quote unquote, privileged access. So the four technologies of whiteness that I'm going to be discussing include addiction neuroscience, new biotechnologies, regulatory structures, and marketing. I'm going to start with the least visible technology of race making, which is brain science. So let's put buprenorphine development on the backdrop of President Bush the first's decade of the brain. And this was an era in which NIDA was directed to look for neuromolecular bases for addiction in anticipation of breakthroughs from the Human Genome Project. Alan Leshner, who was then the director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, um, lobbied to rebrand addiction as a quote unquote chronic relapsing brain disease. And Leshner's ambition was shared by leading NIDA researchers, NIDA-funded researchers, four of whom are on this landmark 2000 paper in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Um, in it, these researchers argued that narcotics addiction is comparable to diabetes, so familiar theme, hypertension and asthma in terms of heredit heritability, treatment adherence, and relapse rates, and that as such, it should be treated in a similar way. Um, in medical care settings with chronic pharmaceuticals. The scientists involved in this movement had a clear social justice intent. They wanted to destigmatize addiction by demonstrating that it's a legitimate biological condition. And what they didn't see was that the scientific universalism of their argument, with its implicit assumption of a standard white male subject, and the unequal ways that biotechnologies are disseminated would actually enhance the social stratification of addiction and its treatment. So for example, brain imaging like this one from Neuron, the journal Neuron, a neuroscience journal, by taking the subject out of his or her trappings of gender, race, and class, and even by actually taking the offending organ out of the body itself. Here we're left with just a brain. The image symbolically conveys an unmarked universality of addiction physiology. And in neuroscience, addiction is further reduced to the molecular level at, of, of action at neuroreceptors, the ultimate disembodiment of addiction. The apparent universality 
of this molecularized model implies an assumed white norm and excludes the social and political from addiction. But the neuroscientists see themselves as reframing addiction as a brain disease for the very purpose of destigmatizing and decriminalizing drug use by bringing it under the purview of medicine rather than criminal justice. The scientists involved here are trying to counteract a punitive drug war mentality by erasing the social and racial foundations of drug use a neurobiological version of colorblind ideology that unconsciously unmarks and whitens opioids by molecular means, which paradoxically ends up further racializing drug policy, as we'll get to in a moment. Okay, so the next technology of whiteness is new biotechnologies. So what I just described made neuroscientists unwitting partners in more consciously racial industrial strategies Building on neuroscientists' ideology of technolo technological solutions to previously socio-political problems, in 1996, Purdue Pharmaceuticals got <coughs> FDA approval for OxyContin as a quote-unquote minimally addictive opio opioid pain reliever suitable for chronic management of moderate pain, like lower back pain. This was based on its patented sustained release capsule technology, which in theory lowered the reward for drug abusers by preventing an initial rush of a large amount of the opioid in the bloodstream. Now at the same time in the backdrop, we had the National Joint Commission on Hospital Accreditation in the late 90s calling for pain to be aggressively monitored and treated as the fifth vital sign uh, alongside heart rate, temperature, respiratory rate. And this too helped lead to its wi widespread opioid prescription for moderate pain. OxyContin users interested in a rush quickly learned how to crush and snort or inject the contents of each capsule, with oxycodone in the capsule being twice as potent as morphine. What followed has been called a public health disaster with vast industries of prescription pill mills cropping up across the country followed by unprecedented overdose rates. After steep increases in opioid misuse and overdose, public pressure mounted for intervention. So in August of 2010, just as the, as the original patent on OxyContin ran out, Purdue Pharmaceuticals introduced its tamper-resistant time-release formulation by embedding oxycodone into polymers that converted into gummies should users attempt to crush and dissolve the contents. By keeping prices high and representing OxyContin as technologically sealed off from misuse, the manufacturer strove to keep OxyContin symbolically a step ahead of urban non-white street, street markets. Another biotechnology developed specifically in response to the white, suburban, and rural prescription opioid epidemic is buprenorphine itself. Commercially released in a combination pill with opioid antagonist naloxone, uh, meaning naloxone is actually something that has the opposite action of an opioid. Um, and it's something that is not released into the bloodstream if suboxone is taken under the tongue as prescribed, but it is released in the bloodstream if it's injected. So it, it causes injectors to go into withdrawal. Reckitt Benckiser Pharmaceuticals promoted this combination of naloxone with buprenorphine in the form of suboxone as a smart drug Although buprenorphine was an abusable opioid, the naloxone um, kept prevented, in their argument, prevented abuse by causing injectors to go into withdrawal. Buprenorphine also posed a lower risk of overdose death than other opioids given that it had a minimal effect on breathing. In the 1990s, NIDA subsidized Suboxone's manufacturer to test it for use in addiction treatment and sharply distinguished it from methadone lobbying Congress and the DEA to lower the abuse potential of Suboxone from the narcotic schedule two, where, Oxy, where Oxycontin and methadone fall, to schedule three, along with common host, household products like coating cough syrup. And this made it possible to prescribe Suboxone in generalist doctor's offices. In a race and class stratified healthcare system, such as in the US, where access to generalist doctors is often limited to those who can pay, Patented technologies designed for private office use in themselves encode white race and middle class. So I'm gonna to go to the third technology of whiteness, which is regulation. 
And I want to mention that OxyContin and Suboxone have unprecedented monitoring and certification requirements at this point for prescribers. So I'm a certified buprenorphine prescriber, otherwise known as Suboxone prescriber. Um, and I had to go through an eight-hour certification for this. Um, and I'm tracked by the DEA every time I prescribe for the drug. There, I, as a psychiatrist, could prescribe what the most lethal chemotherapies for cancer and not have to go through any additional training or monitoring. So uh, Suboxone is actually, the regulations around Suboxone are unprecedented in that way. And the require, these, these regulations are among the social technologies that manufacturers and legislators develop to stratify access to new opioids and to shift the focus of law enforcement from intended white users towards physicians and pharmacies. Although by 2004, prescription opioids had overtaken heroin as the primary opiate of abuse in the US, the arrest rate for their illegal possession was one fourth that for possession of heroin, and arrests for illegal sale of prescription opioids was less than one fifth of the arrests for uh, sale of heroin. Not coincidentally, the non-medical use of pain relievers was twice as high among whites as blacks at that point. And, whites, and while rates of heroin use among blacks, Latinos, and whites, uh, this is in the period where rates of heroin use among blacks, Latinos, and whites were almost identical. Since suburban and rural whites were not politically supportable targets for drug law enforcement, the DEA and other regulators focused their surveillance on prescription opioid prescribers and suppliers. So what do I mean by that? One sign of this has been the spread of prescription drug monitoring programs that have been enacted in 49 states, half of which mandate prescriber participation with threats of loss of license and prosecution if prescribers don't consult a database uh, to see if their patient is being prescribed by other doctors before prescribing. Um, so I come from New York State, which has one of the most punitive um, laws, and uh, physicians can definitely lose their license and even face criminal charges if they don't consult the database. And this is also an unprecedented encroachment on physician autonomy. I've been talking with um, some lawyers for the AMA, the American Medical Association, and this is a, a big point of contention in their lobbying. So returning to buprenorphine, otherwise known as Suboxone, the Drug Addiction Treatment Act was passed by Congress in the year 2000, and it enabled any certified physician to prescribe Suboxone in the privacy of their office, as I mentioned. In congressional debates leading to the passage of Data 2000, there's a clear emphasis on a new kind of drug user, one that's young, suburban, and quote unquote, not hardcore, implicitly white. So this is what I meant by coded language. Uh, in the congressional rec record, you will not see reference to race, particularly white race, anywhere. So suburban stands in for white. Alan Leshner, who at that time again was director of National Institute of Drug Abuse, testified that buprenorphine is uniquely appropriate for a new kind of opioid user as opposed to methadone, quote, which tends to concentrate in urban areas and is a poor fit for the suburban spread of narcotic addiction. In the same congressional hearing, then Health and Human Services Director Donna Shalala notes that buprenorphine as an alternative to methadone would serve a new kind of addict, quote, including citizens who would not normally be associated with the term addiction. Data 2000 kept the methadone system intact and it did nothing to alter the drug laws that mandated inner city heroin users to prison but it did create a new treatment track for those who had the resources to take advantage of it. To give additional assurances to the DEA that buprenorphine wouldn't, otherwise known as Suboxone, would not spill over into illicit markets, buprenorphine's manufacturer, along with the Federal Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA, mandated the eight hour training course that I just described myself having gone through. It was the first and only prescription drug in the US to come with such a requirement. Now, public sector doctors in my interviews tell me that the certification requirement is a major barrier to making buprenorphine available to low-income people because public clinics don't provide time or incentives 
to pursue certification, while prescribers in the private sector can charge fees of, for example, in New York City, $1,000 for half an hour buprenorphine induction visit. The shortage of public sector prescribers, along with the cost of buprenorphine at five to $10 per strip or tablet versus 40 cents per dose of methadone, have kept buprenorphine in the private sector, with some major exceptions. Um, certain cities across the country have made public sector buprenorphine access a priority and heavily subsidized it. An example would be Baltimore, which also had many of the early clinical trials of buprenorphine, so already had a lot of experience with public sector patients who got buprenorphine through clinical trials. So I'm gonna go to the next technology whiteness, which is ethnic marketing. OxyContin's legendary commercial success hinged on its de designation as, again, minimally addictive opioid pain reliever. Um, when OxyContin was under review at the FDA, Purdue estimated the addictive potential of OxyContin to be less than 1% based on testing among terminally ill cancer patients for three month period. So Purdue used this designation to open, open a new opioid market that had previously been restricted to those with acute severe pain, like post-surgical pain and cancer pain. It hired a cadre of almost 700 drug reps who canvassed a call list of 100,000 primary care doctors, and Purdue deliberately targeted generalists in white suburban and rural areas, areas that did not trigger DEA suspicion. Um, so Purdue's strategy was successful. It led to a tenfold increase in prescription opioid prescription nationally and a disproportionate uptake of OxyContin by prescribers in white, suburban, and rural areas of states like Maine, Ohio, Kentucky, and West Virginia. So I'm doing field work in, um, in New York City's microcosm of suburban America, as I like to think of it, Staten Island. Some of you I already know are from the New York City area have been there at some point in your life, so you're nodding your heads. It's the city's widest and most suburban borough. It now has four times the opioid overdose death rate of any borough in New York City. And by the 2000s, it had a local youth culture that celebrated the race privilege of its OxyContin consumption in videos. Um, I'm wondering if this, I was just asking if this could be the first time that you all have been shown a rap video in a lecture. I'm gonna attempt this. So this is the White Trash Clan, whose name is a play on the name of the black rap group Wu-Tang Clan, performing My World is Blue. between marketing and media. Um, certainly, Staten, uh, there are a lot of Staten Island residents who are enraged by it because they thought it glorified uh, the local OxyContin phenomenon, um, OxyContin being blue, little blue tablets. Um, and the impunity that I mentioned that they were celebrating around the race privilege of prescription opioids wasn't complete. 
Do you remember the, um, the fairy at the end who was sniffing powder, Oxycontin powder out of the air? Um, she's called the Blue Fairy. She's a well-known local figure. Two months after the video was released, she was arrested for dealing Oxycontin out of an edible arrangements outlet in a strip mall. Um, unfortunately, four years after that happened, she died of an overdose of opioids. So in the end, it, she didn't have impunity. In a newspaper content analysis that my students and I completed, comparing racial references and articles about urban heroin and racial references and articles about suburban prescription opioid use, Let me get back to the slides. Um, <clears throat> we learned that in contrast to articles about the criminality of black and Latino drug users, suburbanites depicted um, as addicted to Oxycontin are portrayed sympathetically in the media as victims of overprescription or as people struggling with either real or existential pain. Ironically, Purdue's technological response to the first wave of white prescription opioid deaths, that is their tamper-resistant formulation of Oxycontin, combined with the new prescription monitoring programs that I described that, um, that directed law enforcement towards prescribers, towards physicians. These two phenomena led many of these legal Oxycontin users to look for heroin when pills became hard to get. And one consequence of this has been a whitening of media coverage of heroin users who had long been portrayed as black or brown. So this is a um, school teacher who started with prescription opioids and went to injection heroin use. And this is a college athlete. The targeted intervention for these new heroin users, buprenorphine, otherwise known as Suboxone, was marketed to this new group um, middle class insured patients primarily over the internet. And manufacturer sponsored web-based public service announcements featured white professionals and business owners on Suboxone maintenance. So this is the website that I pulled up to get Mike's story, the ad that you saw earlier. And it's interesting to see, to note the racial coding on the, um, on the homepage. So the same website here features a link to the Federal Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration um, that hosts a prescriber referral, an internet-based re prescriber referral system. So browsers can enter their zip code and generate a list of Suboxone prescribers, most of them in private practice, that are in their area. These strategies, um, as you can see, they're, they're coded for class and also race. These strategies created an exclusive yet lucrative market uh, for Suboxone, making it a blockbuster drug at almost $3 billion a year in sales. Um, so this is the National Alliance of Buprenorphine. Yes, it's, this, is, this is Reckitt Benkeiser Pharma, <laughs> right? So uh, otherwise known as the National Alliance for Advocates of Buprenorphine Treatment org in this case. Um, so yeah, I was mentioning what a blockbuster drug Suboxone has become as a result of $3 billion in sales per year. Uh, and this is only secondary to Oxycontin sales, which had reported over $3 billion a year in sales. So in conclusion, this racial segmentation of drug markets into licit and illicit, white and black, clinical and recreational, as dictated by the war on drugs and by opioid manufacturers, creates a, a, time bar, a targeted time-bound um, set of patents on new technologies intended for the white middle class. The forerunner of this, um, actually, quick quiz before I, I flash this next slide. How many of you know when and how heroin was introduced in the United States? Anyone want to take a guess at the year? Yeah? OK, that's, that's a good guess. Certainly a lot of heroin entered the United States around that time. 
Any other guesses? Yeah, in the back. It's 1870. Okay, so that's very close. Yeah, 1898. So this is Bayer Pharmaceuticals heroin, which was marketed in 1898 as um, not only a non-addictive treatment for morphine addiction, but also a cough syrup for children. And I hear it's very effective. <laughs> so, um, so and at the time that heroin was brought out, primarily one of the biggest segments, uh, market segments for heroin was Victorian housewives that were weaning themselves off of heroin, of morphine. Now, it could be otherwise. In France, where buprenorphine was adopted for generalist physician treatment of opiate dependence in 1996, it was billed not as a stigma-reducing agent for middle class, the middle class market, but rather as a public health intervention to stem HIV transmission and overdose among largely low-income immigrant heroin injectors. And as a result, buprenorphine was widely adopted among primary care doctors in poor communities in France. And of course, we're also talking about a single-payer healthcare system where everyone had access to a primary care doctor. As a result, you have a question? I just, listen, now there was very little methadone penetration in France before mm -hmm. that. So there, were, there were a lot of, yes. So that's, so that's an important part of it. Thank you, yeah. So there were a lot of different reasons why buprenorphine was widely adopted in France as a public health strategy as opposed to methadone. One of them being, you're absolutely right, that there wasn't, uh, there was a lot of resistance among French psychiatrists in particular to methadone maintenance. Um, and primary care doctors were an easier venue for an opioid maintenance treatment than through psychiatrists and mental health professionals. Um, but the point that I wanted to make was that in France, where buprenorphine was distributed through primary care doctors, just as it has been in this country, the overdose rate dropped by 80% in the first seven years after buprenorphine's release. And it's interesting to note that in the US, in the first decade after buprenorphine's release as a primary care-based treatment, the overdose rate has actually exponentially gone up. So um, based on my field work with white and non-white people trying to get access to buprenorphine and stay on buprenorphine, I want to suggest that a piece of this puzzle um, is that the public health potential of buprenorphine is, limit, is limited in our racially motivated, restrictive, and market-driven healthcare system, which orphans patients without continuous prescribers or coverage. So I've seen this happen over and over again. When you're talking about a maintenance drug like Suboxone or buprenorphine, um, regular access to the same provider who's familiar with you is vital, and a lot of people get cut, cut off from their prescriber. So the French example highlights alternatives to the binary of biomedical versus punitive frames for drug policy. A public health social determinants-based approach, for example, would directly address institutional racism, geography, and social class as correlates of addiction. In both of the prevailing US frames of criminal justice on one hand and biomedicine on the other, addiction is highly individualized, making, um, and based on a logic of consumer choice, which makes systemic racialization hard to see. So I'm going to end on the note of racially segregated drug policies and lucrative prescription narcotic markets that can only be sustained if there's a separate route to categorize and discipline drug use among whites. And that route must appear, at least on its face, to be race neutral. This has its costs that are borne by whites who, again, pay inflated prices for drugs that are constantly being patented. Um, and they also sometimes pay with their lives. The ambiguity of the Greek word pharmakon, its dual identity as medicine and poison, is exploited in this white war on drugs that wasn't, in which unprecedented profits are made in the liminal space between licit and illicit sales, a space that's protected by its symbolic whiteness. Thank you. So do we have any time left over? Okay, thank you.
thank you for asking that question. That's actually where I am right now because uh, the latest headlines now are that women outnumber men in heroin use. And that's the first time, again, in this past century that women for an illicit narcotic have, un have outnumbered men. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that women have long outnumbered men in licit narcotic use. Uh, they tend to go to doctors more frequently. They tend to be treated for pain more frequently. Uh, and so the whole phenomenon of transferring from prescription opioids to heroin has been a heavily gendered one, um, favoring women uh, as a result. So um, one thing that's interesting to look at in the media coverage is, for example, the portrayal of mothers. Um, we have seen decades of really punitive enforcement against mothers who are addicted. And we're seeing a turn in the tide uh, when it comes to the portrayal of addicted mothers anyway. A um, lot more sympathetic portrayal. Um, and also, I, I, I guess maybe I'll turn back to you and ask a little bit about what motivated that question. Uh, I, Is this something that you've been working on? Thank you for mentioning it too, because what I as an anthropologist have been really interested in is the cultural work that these representations do. Right. So what my hypothesis about the coverage of heroin addicted women and particularly their struggles as mothers is that um, women in general are much more sympathetic characters um, and in a campaign to change drug policy, uh, they're useful agents. Um, so, rep so one of the common threads underlying this is this crisis of social reproduction. You saw the, newspaper, the headings, the newspaper headings that I showed involved um, teachers. You know, one of the common um, scenarios is also suburban soccer mom who goes from prescription opioids for back pain to heroin injecting in the bathroom uh, between soccer games. So, um, so this feeds into, in a very gendered way, this discourse of the crisis of the white American. What are we to do? Uh, we can't reproduce ourselves. And there's definitely a, um, an economic undertone to that too. So heroin addiction is kind of, it's standing in also for a lot of anxieties about the economic landscape and economic as well as social and biological reproduction. So that's kind of, that's where I'm going with my own gendered analysis, just trying to figure out what work is the representation of these heroin addicted white women doing. But I thank you for bringing it up. It's, it's a really interesting phenomenon. And there is this disjuncture between epidemiological data and what the um, media is really playing up. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll take you first and then come to you. Oh. Thank you for bringing that up too. Uh, because again, here, there are two different levels that we could analyze. One is, what is the epidemiology of use? And there certainly is a cohort of um, white Americans 
primarily middle-aged Americans who are prescribed opioid pain relievers and then become dependent on it. And that's a big phenomenon of Staten Island. One of the theories about why Staten Island became the epicenter, so to speak, of prescription opioids in New York City is that a high percentage of the residents of Staten Island are um, leadership of NYPD, police department, NYFD, fire department, um, working in construction, having um, chronic injuries, uh, bodily injuries that lead them to get prescription opioids. But the second layer of that is that the majority of prescription opioid non-medical users actually aren't the ones prescribed the drug directly. So there, there, there is a cohort of people who are getting prescriptions and over prescriptions. You know, the rate of prescription is much higher in the US than any other country. So the marketing techniques I described have been extremely effective. But an even larger group of people are secondary users. They're getting it from a secondary market. On the other hand, what you're also bringing up is um, what is the representation of prescription opioid use? And again, the, the sympathetic kind of um, thrust of media coverage of this population, um, I think necessarily brings it back to people who were legitimately being medically treated initially, right? So Mike is a good example. He's someone that um, started off with a back injury working in a diner and then got prescribed and then things spiraled from there. So I think that, again, there's a certain kind of cultural work that's taking place by honing in on people who are prescribed. And then um, my argument is that because these folks aren't um, people that generate a lot of calls for punitive law enforcement, the prescribers have been the next target. And that's one reason why prescription drug monitoring has taken off so much in this country as a primary strategy. The doctors, you know, there's also, in my media analysis, I found this thread of dirty doctors, doctors that were um, unscrupulous uh, prescribers, often presented as foreign medical graduates, ironically mm -hmm. enough. So non-white doctors. And then, I'm sorry, you had your hand up. What a great question, and I'm not sure I have a complete answer. So one thing that is happening is that doctors are facing criminal prosecution when patients, their patients are overdosing um, and they're shown to have prescribed without proper procedures and checks. So we're seeing that. We're seeing that doctors are facing jail time. Um, now the second question, though, of what's happening with law enforcement in suburbia? Could there be a criminalizing backlash somehow. Um, and the, it turns out the, comp the story is much more complicated than what I laid out because arrest rates are going up in a lot of predominantly white areas. They're certainly nowhere near the arrest rates for um, urban black and brown communities, but they are going up. So it's a complicated story. I think it's a war that's being waged. And that's kind of, that's a lot of the urgency behind the portrayals of people who are addicted, um, lobbying and efforts that are taking place. In New York State, for example, we have this Good Samaritan Law that um, basically shelters people who call 911, call emergency if someone they're with has overdosed from drug charges. Um, and that was a law that was, that was proposed by a Republican assemblyman who had up until that point been quite pro-drug war uh, law enforcement. So um, we're seeing a, ca a change in cast of characters and we're seeing some um, Republican former kind of hawkish drug warriors starting to go for more harm reductionist approaches. But at the same time, there is some law enforcement going on in these white communities that hadn't been happening before. So it's, I think it's, it's in action, it's a dynamic um, process. One thing that I sometimes get asked and, asked and I ask myself a lot is, how does the white opioid quote unquote epidemic compared to crystal meth? Because there you have a relatively recent drug epidemic that affected pri primarily whites. In that case, primarily poor whites, um, as well as gay men, um, 
primarily men in, um, in urban centers. And there, the law enforcement was pretty heavy, actually. It was a pretty punitive um, response, and media coverage of crystal people addicted to crystal meth was not flattering at all um, and re very moralizing. So <clears throat> I have colleagues, for example, in sociology at the University of Kentucky who did research on crystal meth and drug policy uh, law enforcement whose racial analysis is that crystal meth law enforcement was most punitive in states that were pretty much all white, where the crystal meth problem was um, highly classed. Um, and in fact, he goes further to argue that in our, in our country where we have such a strong linkage symbolically between class and race, that poor whites in these states were standing in for blacks or non-whites. That in a sense, they are being treated as honorary blacks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but a lot of the ways that they were portrayed and the narrative around them were similar to the ones that we see uh, around blacks in urban areas where the dividing line is racial. I see a couple of hands in the corner. Okay. Have you noticed any patterns or trends in terms of the age and the participation or role people assume in the markets? The role they assume in the market. So for example, right, you said it's a secondary market. Yeah. Um, have you noticed any trends or patterns among the, age, the ages of market participants? Example. Secondary uh, consumers are younger or older. Secondary right. So, well, so for example, in Staten Island, I was showing you that kind of the youth culture around OxyContin youth, and there, yeah, there's a there's a vibrant, um, initially, OxyContin and prescription opioid dealing economy that has um, has shifted to heroin, for sure, and that's another um, interesting evolving discourse. A lot, in a lot of these communities, the question is, where's all this heroin coming from? You know, initially, they were asking, where's all this prescription opioid coming from? And they could point to the doctors. So the doctors became the dirty doctors and the dealers. So now the question is, where's the heroin coming from? And in New York City, the media coverage is around the so-called heroin highway. And again, it's racialized. So there was a, an article that came out two years ago showing um, the dealers, kind of the chain of drug dealing that led up to Staten Island, and um, it showed origin in the South Bronx, you know, and so the, the pictures that they used to represent the dealers there were of black and Latino arrestees. So the idea is that this is coming from the outside, again. But no patterns in terms of age. But that's how it's being represented. I'm not saying that that's actually what's happening, and in fact, um, people working in Staten Island are saying that no, there's an, in, there's an indigenous heroin trade now in Staten Island. Um, so it's not necessarily all coming from the South Bronx. But what were you saying? In terms of age. Age, age yeah. yeah. So the, the youth culture that I was trying to show, definitely there is, um, there is a split. That there, there are these two modes of users middle-aged people who often are the recipients of the prescriptions and then young people who are often getting it from the secondary market. There's definitely an age pattern too. Oh, I think in the back you had a question. Yeah, yeah um, thank you for this talk. <laughs> um, so I think the widening of the opioid epidemic, at least in Illinois, has led to this opportune moment where there's bipartisan support um, at the legislative level to, for, um, perhaps funding, perhaps not, around um, work to combat the epidemic. And I was wondering if you could talk more on your ideas around the public health approach. I think I understand, you know, the Baltimore model of public access of people marketing is like a terrific example, but if you had other thoughts on, it, on where we sort of move next then to sort of reduce disparities and still address this broadly. Yeah, I think that that's a tough, not to crack on many levels. Um, one thing we have to ask ourselves is why don't we have universal health care? <laughs> and there's so many, because you know, you'd have to have access to doctors, right? To have uh, a primary care based treatment strategy. And um, even though it's, it's nice in theory, um, the way that I see it playing out on the ground is that people who are less well off and who have a less secure uh, access to doctors are actually probably at higher risk for overdose because 
they're constantly on and off maintenance treatments. It's not sustained. And um, people are at high risk for overdose in that period where they're coming off. So, and especially if their tolerance goes down, if they um, have been off of opioids long enough to have reduced tolerance, which is one reason why um, overdose rates are actually quite high in many black and brown communities, like um, one thing I didn't mention in New York City, the second highest rate of opioid overdoses in the South Bronx, among largely black and Latinos, black and Latino residents, um, many of whom are coming out of prison or jail and have had a period of enforced abstinence, have a lowered tolerance, and then are really high risk for overdose right after release. That hasn't gotten the same amount of attention, and I know there's now more media coverage of that disparity. Um, but to get back to your question, okay, so what would a harm reduction strategy look like? What would a public health strategy? Public health strategy would include harm reduction. Um, and it wouldn't be market driven in the way that our system is. One reason that Suboxone took off like it did was that it was on patent and the manufacturers saw this terrific opportunity for themselves that involved putting up large barriers around who could get access. So there was a certain economic logic that was wedded to our racialized drug policy um, that made it hard to get buprenorphine and hard to stay on it. So we'd have to address that problem. Um, so on the, and the, another thing that I wanted to mention kind of as a stopgap when it comes to policy making is my colleague at Drug Policy Alliance, Julie Netherland, has been working with New York State Assembly people on the concept of a racial impact analysis of drug policies that are introduced, analogous to environmental impact analyses of laws that have um, some implication for the environment. Uh, and so there, that's not really an answer to your question of, well, how do we build up a system that's um, less disparate all around, uh, where everyone can have access to harm reduction strategies? Um, but it's an example of some policy level initiatives that we might start to look at to directly address the racial inequality in the ways that drug policy and drug treatment are being disseminated now. Uh, but I think we kind of, this, this really is a question of um, social equity overall. You know, drugs stand in for these larger phenomena um, and help to reinforce them because of all of the racialized stigma around addiction and, and drug use. Yeah? Um, I'm curious, so I mean, within your answer, you kind of addressed what you had behind you. Well, what a great question. I'm, I'm just a humble anthropologist, psychiatrist. Um, so I don't know how, how big the audiences are that I've reached, but um, I see many of my colleagues trying to do what I'm doing here, which is to argue that there are harms to white people of the current racial hierarchy that we have. And other, so there are some other avenues. It's a tricky argument to make um, because the benefits of white privilege are so obvious everywhere you look. But um, for example, my colleague Jonathan Metzl is working on gun laws and lethality of whiteness around gun laws. Um, so the free access to guns that our country has are killing off whites as well as other racial groups. Um, and the gun laws themselves are based on a racial ideology. Um, my colleague, Mindy Fullylove, who is a psychiatrist turned urbanist, you nod your head as though you might have seen her speak. Yeah. <laughs> so you may have heard the thread of what she argues, which is that racial segregation in city policies is harmful to whites as well as blacks because it limits where they go. There's a cost to a gated community um, philosophy or uh, worldview. Um, there are lots of places you can't go. Um, in New York City, for example, as with many major cities, including Chicago, a lot of neighborhoods have seen um, ethnic cohorts 
uh, uh, that rotate. So, you know, white ethnic ghettos, uh, white flight to suburbia, then followed by other immigrant groups. What that means is that there are a lot of white families who have lost connection to their neighborhoods of origin. Um, and what Mindy likes to hone in on is kind of the affective dimensions of not having the family church anymore, you know, the places where the grandparents' generation grew up. Um, there's this loss of connection and ties, and certainly the lifestyle in suburbia, many people have argued, um, represents a loss of community and connection. Um, so there's a cost to that, to sealing yourself off from others. Um, but it's, it, it's, it's an argument that I think we have to press, and it's very hard to see. It's hard to see the harms of whiteness, as it is hard to see whiteness in general, just by design. It's a great question, though. Thank you. So, Harold? Okay. Oh, you're, you're next? I'm sorry. Thanks, Harold. <laughs> That's such a great question. So let's see, the first, there's a two-part question. <laughs> and the first part, yeah. access to yeah. Savasone, right. Okay, so the interesting thing about <coughs> the 1990s, <coughs> excuse me, to 2000s prescription opioid phenomenon is that it created new distribution systems. So many of these rural areas actually were targeted by these uh, drug reps that Purdue hired. Um, and one reason that they were targeted is that they're off of the radar of the DEA and all that stuff. Um, and these were primary care docs that didn't have a lot of experience with opioids and um, really took the argument of the manufacturer and did a lot of prescribing. So what that did was it opened up new distribution networks that um, when Suboxone came along, we're tapped, so this Benkes, or manufacturer of Suboxone, definitely wanted to piggyback onto OxyContin. That they were chasing OxyContin. So we're talking about this new rural distribution network. And then when it comes to opioid maintenance, rural areas are typically pretty far away from methadone program. Uh, but you already had a cadre of community doctors that were in the habit of prescribing opioids. Um, so this was, this was a network for them. Then the other interesting phenomenon now is rural heroin distribution. So in a funny way, Purdue opened up new distribution networks for heroin cartels 20 years down the line. Um, let's see, the second part of your question, remind me, was? Oh, OK, so yeah, so why were rural whites demonized during crystal meth and not demonized now? So my hypothesis there is that it had to do, again, with ethnic marketing and the way that interacted with going, getting around drug regulators. So the target audience had to be portrayed as suburban. Uh, these were decent middle-class folks who just so happened to have regular access to a primary care doctor, too, and good insurance, um, but who were not going to trigger the resistance and suspicion of drug regulators. So, um, so that's why the target audience or the target population for OxyContin was certainly portrayed as suburban, even though rural doctors were also canvassed. Um, and that's one reason why Suboxone was presented as being the answer to suburban opioid use. So in the congressional record, they use the word suburban over and over and over, and over again. So, um, so the, the face, the public face of OxyContin and therefore Suboxone was not only white but middle class. 
And to some extent, we're seeing a little bit more coverage <coughs> now of um, Rust Belt people. And I think a lot of it follows the Angus uh, Deaton and, and Case article because they point out in that article that the group most heavily affected by overdoses is um, blue collar, middle, middle aged blue collar workers. Um, so I, I see that changing a little bit, but we're talking about a very different political history to prescription opioids as opposed to crystal meth, which was not a phenomenon started by pharma and um, wasn't something that was crafted to get around racialized regulators. So I'm not sure I have the answer to that, but my suspicion is that when it comes to media coverage, there is a political motive, and that is to create sympathy. Um, so having started this momentum behind humanizing stories of suburban prescription opioid users, that has continued in the exploration of Rust Belt, blue collar, former workers. Um, now there was, the reason I said oh, was that I realized that I should qualify and say that from the late 90s, early 2000s, there was this discourse of hillbilly heroin and Oxycontin being really heavily used in the Appalachian Mountains, for example. So there was that thread also in the media. Again there, I think the circumstances surrounding it were just so different than crystal meth. So from the beginning, we could, even, we could even look at the fact that crystal meth was a cottage industry and illegal from the beginning as opposed to prescription opioids which in the, had the force of pharma lobby behind them to kind of humanize them from the beginning and decriminalize them from the, the beginning. So that's my answer to it, but it's probably not complete. And then, let's see, Harold? Yeah, I'm just looking at it. I think we're at the witching hour, so I can again oh. ask you. Uh, okay. We're at time. So, oh, okay. okay. Thank okay. you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. What great question.